You're listening to Productivity Protected, the podcast that's all about data privacy and security. We'll unpack emerging threats, hot issues in data security, and top ways to protect your data and how you work. Here's your host, Spencer Kupferman. Welcome back to the Productivity Protected podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kupferman, the CEO of PKWare, and we have a fantastic, fantastic podcast for all of you today. This is, I can't believe it's number 16, but this is number 16. I can't believe we've done 16 of these. Uh, this is the data risk management best practices and predictions. And we have a very special guest, as all of our listeners know, we always have very special guests. Uh, we have a great, great guy who comes to us from a strategic partner, very strategic partner. Uh, his name is Dan Gregory. He's a VP of Solution Architecture at Converge. And Converge, for all of you out there, uh, Converge is a services-led organization. They do a fantastic job of all different aspects uh, in cyber. We're fortunate enough to be uh, partnered uh, with Converge, and Dan is really uh, the tip of the spear uh, with us. And uh, if I can, I'm going to read a little bio uh, to educate our audience uh, on Dan and is very, very, uh, very, very highly credentialed. So 22 years, uh, 22 years of experience developing cybersecurity solutions uh, for organizations to address regulatory compliance mandates, assessments, policy reviews, and development, as well as internal process audits. Uh, as Converge VP of Solution Architecture, within the cybersecurity practice, his team leads the company's efforts in deploying solution-based integrations designed to protect clients' critical infrastructure, data, brand confidence, uh, and reputation. Dan has a deep understanding of the financial, healthcare, manufacturing, and retail industries, has performed countless control assessments in these fields. He has extensive experience in developing and executing compliance and regulatory strategies and conducting internal and external audits. Throughout his career, Dan's demonstrated exceptional leadership skills and has been instrumental in creating high performance teams that consistently deliver outstanding results. Skilled communicator, collaborator, known for building strong relationships with stakeholders, clients, and partners. Dan has also been a CISO. So for all of, all of our CISOs out there listening in, uh, Dan understands what you go through uh, on an hourly, daily basis in your organizations. Dan holds degrees in computer science and is also has a certification uh, in information systems manager. That's a CISM. His knowledge, experience, and passion uh, for a very passionate about delivering exceptional solutions uh, make him a very valuable asset to converge uh, in all the industries that he serves, and especially our partnership with PK, where I want to welcome Dan Gregory to the Productivity Protected Podcast. That's right, data risk management, best practices and predictions. Welcome, Dan Gregory. Well, thanks for having me, guys. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Great to have you. And again, um, appreciate, I just wanted to say on behalf of PKWare, appreciate the partnership uh, and the trust uh, and the confidence uh, that you have in our PK Protect uh, platform, uh, in our people. I know you've spent a lot of time uh, in the trenches with our people, certainly uh, just at RSA, um, uh, at the conference in San Francisco, uh, with us uh, in the booth and, and everywhere else. Uh, around that venue. And um, I, I just hear so many great, every time I hear a story about a partner, your name always comes up. Uh, and I appreciate, like I said, appreciate the commitment uh, and um, and the trust that Converge has put uh, in, in PKWare. It's mutually beneficial. Uh, a few things on that real quick. As you know, we, we only work with strategic partners that fill a need and a gap that not only we recognize in the industry, but what our customers are coming to us to fill. Um, so it's not taken lightly, uh, as you guys probably know, some of you here on, the, on this call and, and others at PKWare, uh, putting you guys through the gauntlet, making sure that there's a good alignment there, uh, culturally, technically, and everything across the board. So it's, it's easy to work with you guys. But at the end of the day, our reputation, it converges on the line when we recommend certain things. And it's, again, not something we take lightly. Um, it's not the panacea. Nobody is. But we like to try to cover as many of the needs as we can um, in an efficient, you know, efficient way that's really cost conscious of what our customers are looking to get done. So, 
Appreciate the uh, the partnership. Uh, thank you for that, Dan. I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump right in, Dan. We we've, we've got a number we've got a number of questions. I'm gonna jump in here if I can and, and open up this this uh, this podcast uh, with the following questions here. I think it's more of a two part question, so just hang with me if you can. So you know you you've seen a lot. You you've been around this space for more than more than two decades, as I as I mentioned uh, in your bio. Um, in the cybersecurity space, and, and you've seen a lot of change and a lot of advancement, uh, for sure, a lot of advancement over that 20 years. Uh, and I guess the, the, the question is as follows, is what, I guess, what are some of the biggest evolutions in, in data risk management that you've, that you've part seen, participated in, that have emerged over that period? And then to follow on to that, um, that answer, how have, have these evolutions, if you will, helped companies uh, create uh, risk management programs for for better cyber hygiene sure sure great question so first of all uh the value uh of data has changed significantly think back 10 years 15 years ago um and where data resided um and how difficult it would have been to get into an organization find some data after rooting around for a while and then extract it um much harder more difficult on higher level of a challenge than it is today, unfortunately. Um, it's become its own industry, okay? Complete with healthcare, PTO, and everything else. These ethic, these hackers, okay, I'll call them uh, kindly, um, have figured it out. Um, path of least resistance, everything's connected, it's hyper-connected, and that affected the value of data. It's more accessible now, and everything is data. So the old saying is follow the money. Well, behind the money, giving it value, giving it worth now is more and more and more is becoming information, is becoming data. Okay, so you can sell that as a commodity, um, and that's what they're after. Um, so first of all, I've seen the value of data, um, the accessibility of data. Um, it's ubiquitous now. It's everywhere, and it's very hard to protect. It's like um, the liquid of your network is data, and it seeps in the cracks and goes in places you really don't want it to go. And sometimes the bad guys can come and take a sip at the well. Uh, it, it, it occurs to me that that those are some of the things I've seen change in the biggest evolutions of data, impacting data risk management directly, the way you manage the risk, because you now no longer have a firm grip on where the data is, because it can be anywhere and everywhere. Um, and usually it's in places you don't want it to be. Um, and that kind of perpetuates out more and more, because more people can share it without being checked um, and again, it's like liquid. It just leaks in those places you don't want it. I think the second part of that question was, um, how have these evolutions helped uh, companies create uh, their own risk management programs? Yeah. So it's forced them to, uh, well, first of all, standards and regulations. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure on this uh, podcast somewhere down the line, we're going to get into the, some more of those four-letter acronyms and, and, and things of that nature uh, around risk management. But it's forcing them to stop and raise their bar and become a little bit more mature in the way that they handle data, okay? Um, those evolutions um, are good, okay? So metal sharpens metal, right? When an adversary bumps up against you enough, you figure out how to defend yourself. So we're raising the bar constantly and we're light years ahead. Even average organizations have tools um, and the ability to protect data um, much better than they were doing 10, 15 years ago. So it's, it's been a constant change of evolution and it's forcing us to raise our bar and how we develop and maintain risk management programs. I never thought about what the one thing that phrase that stuck out to me in that answer was value of data. That, mm -hmm. that to me uh, makes a lot of sense. And, and um, the data is, it's, it's more valuable now. Let's just put that simply. It's more valuable now. Therefore, uh, we've got to do more to protect it. But let's let's keep going here. We're going to get there right now as far as all these acronyms, and I'm going to drop a few of them here for you, and you can elaborate uh, on them for our for our audience. Some data compliance mandates uh, like HIPAA, uh, never heard of that one, um, have been around for a while, uh, while others like GDPR, CCPA, and PCI DSS continue to change how organizations collect, use, store, uh, and protect their data. Aside from making data security even more top of mind. What are some of the implications these data compliance mandates have had on data security? Yeah, so the, um, the evolution this is a great transitional question because it, it really kind of uh, tees out the last part of that first question you asked. So thinking about where uh, the evolution of data real quick before I, I launch into a response, 
So you used to have data in the data center, then it went more closer to the edge, and now identity is the new edge of your network. So keeping that in mind, right, as I kind of go through these, it's forcing discipline uh, into organizations and how they mold uh, and shape their security-minded cultures, okay? So everybody's a little bit different. As you can imagine, if you walk into a healthcare organization versus a manufacturing environment uh, versus uh, a law firm or an entertainment venue, um, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. They're all going to have a very different response to this, but the temper it down and maybe and find like a common, the common denominator across all of those is it's forcing them to up their game. Uh, right now, you know, you're a steward of the data, right? Or you're, you're security minded culture. Um, and there's other statements like that. Those didn't exist seven, eight years ago. We weren't thinking that way. So it's, it's forcing organizations to get down to the individual end user level and say, listen, you're all coming in contact with the most valuable commodity we have at this company. It isn't the parts that we make. It isn't the machines that we make them with or, you know, all the other analogies you can come up with different uh, uh, organizations. It's that data, that information. So forcing that um, level of maturity from a security-minded culture, um, everybody needs to be responsible for it. And there's training behind all that. And it's just constantly um, happening. Now, I'm not saying it's happening idealistically across all organizations the way it should, um, but it's happening more and more now. And it's it's a topic. It's actually a whole level of organizational conversation that's happening now that never used to happen. And it's going to get better and better. Those compliance mandates drive that behavior because all the money now, um, HIPAA, GDPR, CCPA, PCI, and all the other ones, there are specific penalties or things that would impact the bottom line, the revenue of the company if you do not adhere to those. And that they got more teeth now. So that's the second part of the answer is back in the day when some of these uh, three or four letter acronyms started popping up, there were no consequences, okay? PCI came around and there was a bit of a game changer. It was a bellwether. If you didn't subscribe to and adhere to all the controls and PCI, you could have your uh, um, ability revoked to process a credit card. Well, that'll hit the bottom line pretty quick if you can't get money in. So it's funny how that works, right? If there's money, we're all coin operated, things tend to happen a little bit faster. So I think those are things that are happening. And it's I think it's a good thing overall. It's increasing the bar. It's making us more risk uh, conscious and making ultimately securing the data. Um, we need tools to do that, though. That's where you guys come in. No, I agree. I agree. Ultimately, it's it's good, uh, even though we're having to fight off a lot of bad uh, yeah. to, to get to that point. Um, and I want to stick, if we can, Danny, I want to stick with the compliance uh, discussion here, just because it is so big and meaningful uh, in our space. We know, you know, compliance is an ongoing process uh, in something like PCI DSS. Uh, for example, PCI DSS compliance will never be a, a one and done deal uh, mm -hmm. because organizations are always amassing more data and regulations are are continuing to evolve. Uh, it almost seems like like daily, uh, but there are ongoing practices like continuity planning and risk assessments that that can help uh, support this. Uh, how have you seen practices and tools like this positively impact organizations uh, as they build their culture? of security, which is what you were just referring to earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the last question, we talked more about operational um, behaviors and culture, um, the way that that translates down into the um, tools, which is part of that question. Have you, uh, I think it was like, uh, how have you seen uh, practices and tools? Um, I take that as a kind of a, the framework. Now it's going to drive um, a prioritization. Um, and that's generally what I've seen more and more is what do you prioritize first? Okay, so without getting into the um, the nerdy weeds of the whole thing, the the controls assessments or the uh, the guidelines frameworks, call it what you will. PCI DSS is a great example. Uh, I'll dumb it down. Let's say that there are twenty things in PCI DSS that they say you shall do. Okay, well, what dictates the prioritization of those twenty things? Number one is going to be the first thing you should be doing. All those other guidelines and frameworks are basically the same. The same way. Number one is the first thing on the list you should be doing. Working your way down the list in general. So, what changes the prioritization of those frameworks and guidelines? Literally, 
are a bunch of three or four letter acronym organizations, half of which come from the government, some come from the, uh, the public space and such. They get together regularly and go, how should we reprioritize these? Oh, it's based on breach activity, threat intelligence, and what's going on in the global environment, right? So they'll sit down and reprioritize those, okay? And those are the order in which they recommend you prioritize your initiatives. And that's what's really prioritizing eventually the tools. I, I say all this to give you context on the on the thing that I really wanted to get to. Data, data security in the CIS, okay? There's a CIS framework, used to be down in the teens out of the 20 things that it used to have on its list. It is now number three. So if that is not an indicator or a bellwether for all of those that conversation I just had and wrapping it up in the prioritization with the threat intelligence and the breach notifications around the world, I don't know how else to make it more clear. It's it's driven by act, bad actors and activity. And they sat down and goes, guys, we need to make data close to the top of the list. Um, so it's driving that. It's really having a significant impact. And that affects the tools that you buy and the order that you buy them and how you prioritize your spend and your budget for IT. It needs to be focused on data. A major portion of their spend for tools should go towards protecting data directly, building layers around that from the inside out. You know, because we're talking about uh, data risk management here, I, I want to I want to double click a little bit uh, here on on the risk assessment concept, uh, which um, the the personalized risk assessments, which actually uh, PKWare uh, and uh, Converge do in conjunction uh, with each other for, for your customers. Uh, and we, we kind of personalize that and customize that, um, I guess. So together we've been able to show really in a matter of days where uh, companies may be leaving data uh, at risk uh, and, and trying to help them really uncover how best to protect that data. How are these, uh, these data risk assessments, or as we call them, DRAs, uh, helping companies, even those who even those who may think they actually may think, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, we're low risk. You know, we're not, you know, we're not one of we're not one of those uh, companies. We've got fantastic cyber hygiene all the way around the house. Uh, even if you're one of those, uh, be better prepared to keep sensitive data protected. After all, that's what, as you said, this is what this is all about. Yeah. So the data risk assessment uh, program that we've we've uh, developed it and in conjunction with each other is has been interesting, um, and it's followed that uh, the same kind of things we were talking about in questions one and two about data being liquid. So smart organizations and most of them know uh, that that water level is a little above their 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 nose in most cases, and they know they've got a problem with it. it is single singly the hardest thing to manage is data, where it goes, who owns it what access they had to that data, how they got that access, and are you monitoring all those activities that are associated with what people are doing with your data? Okay, so all that to kind of frame up uh, a little bit more of a direct response. The data risk assessment, we gotta, we, let's define what that means. What risks are we assessing? Let's, let's give it some meat, let's have some rubber hit the road. So right now, if I were to interview you and your potential or prospective customer, I would say, Answer the following question any way you want, but on a scale of one to 10, 10 being um, you absolutely know the answer to this, and one is you have no clue. Uh, right now, would you be able to tell me where all of your unstructured data is? So think emails, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, everything that's not a database. How well would you know where all of your data is? Does it have the appropriate level of access to the right people, just enough for them to do their job, but no more, no less? And is there aged data lying around? Is there legacy information? Is there duplicate data? How much of this is duplicate? Um, you get where I'm going with that, right? And most of the times, if you're being honest, most organizations are going to be start going, okay, I get the idea. Halfway through that question, like, you're right. I, I don't really have a good answer to that question because it's hard. It's very difficult. Um, so we find that there's some pain there. That's where the data risk assessments come in, answering those questions scanning the environment and finding out where the aged duplicate, um, overly accessible, overly exposed data, uh, that should be pretty self-evident as to why that would be at risk. You don't want it to have it sitting out there. Um, the analogy um, that I use is go in the middle of a six lane freeway and stand there 
for an hour. It, chances are pretty good you're going to get hit by a car. Now go stand out there for a millionth of a second. You, you might not get hit in that millionth of a second. So don't let that legacy data sit around. The longer it does, time is your enemy. That increases the level of risk as well. So that's another thing we need to look at, that aged data. Um, so the DRA is a tool that was born out of necessity. So that's what we're talking about. It drives ingenuity. So we said, let's build a better mousetrap. Let's figure out a way to answer all those questions together in a lightweight package. From that, the DRA was created. Uh, of course, as I said earlier, I love the partnership, uh, appreciate what it represents. But of course, at, at the core of that partnership is uh, is, the, is the DRA. Um, that's that's to me a, a, a backbone piece uh, that we have to start with, um, and something we both can kind of wrap our arms around there in the interest of our customer, and we start there, and then we go from there. And um, it certainly does. Uh, it gives off a lot of information uh, that we need from our customers. Uh, if we if we don't know where our data is, we can't protect it. I think that's that's kind of what you're saying. Uh, that's the bottom line. Um, and uh, we're certainly aligned on that. Uh, let's keep going here. Um, security cultures uh, sound like they are as unique as the businesses and industries uh, that they function in. Uh, what are some of the particular challenges and solutions that range across all industries uh, and where you have seen specialized approaches uh, really move the needle? Yeah. So it's 2023, last day check. Um, it's a connected world. Uh, we have this thing now called the internet and it's forced us all to share information to survive. So no organization lives on its own and you share data and information now more than you ever have with organizations outside of your own. So when you do that, um, and this is one of those things that is across all industries, healthcare organizations don't operate alone. Manufacturing organizations don't operate alone. You get the idea. Banks don't operate alone. You all need trading partners. You all need suppliers. You need third-party um, connections to the outside world. And when you do that, you could have built the best network in the world with the tightest controls in the world, and you know where all your data is. As soon as you poke a hole in that uh, you know, outer edge of the, of the uh, shell, you open it up to bad things might happen, right? So... That's one of those things that is ubiquitous, is how do you protect that data wherever it goes, okay? Another reason for the strong partnership that we've got with you guys is you do a great job of silently um, taking care of that problem, okay? I'm not going to nerd out and go down that rabbit hole, uh, but you know what I mean. You follow the data wherever it goes, regardless of who infrastructure it happens to fall on. And it's nice uh, to be able to give that assurance and protect that data in that mode when it goes somewhere else. So that's one of the biggest ones I've seen is third-party risk is as it's known in cybersecurity parlance um, and how to protect data when it does go across those lines to somebody else's organization. Um, keeping an eye on it, protecting it and only allowing those people who should be able to see the data access to the data. So that's one of the biggest ones I've noticed. No, that's great. And I I, I agree. That's uh, That makes... That makes a lot of sense. I think, um, uh, you know, people, you know, AI is something, of course, we never heard of that either. Uh, AI, uh, it seems like it's on every, every uh, message I get now in my inbox. It's it's just, so uh, let me let me just uh, get into that here for, for a second. I think, you know, with the rapid advancements we're seeing in AI, uh, they're hard to ignore. Uh, and, and, and other technologies, of course, uh, you and I, I, it's fair to say we both we both know that we should expect major changes in risk management and cybersecurity, um, and maybe even at a faster pace than the changes we've seen in the previous 20 years, which you spoke to. Um, any insight that you, you know, from your experiences uh, uh, around that, that you could share for our listeners, um, you know, what would, what can we expect to see uh, in the future, uh, in, in you know, in how I guess, is there a way we can preempt or or prepare better for that now than maybe we have historically as as a community? Yeah. So in future um, 
and questions that require kind of like projections into the future. I always like to kind of reflect a tiny bit on the past to give you um, kind of a relevance with where I'm projecting this. So AI, machine learning language, uh, mach machine learning rather, has been a part of cybersecurity and what we do and the tools that we bring to the table and the technology we sell to our customers and everything else for quite a long time, actually. Um, what makes this different, and by this, it's like the the implement, you know, the advent of Chat GBT and all these other things. Uh, what makes it different is now it's a lot of that power has been let out of the bottle. The smoke's out of the bottle, and it's known, and it's going to change the way we live and work and act and talk with uh, with each other um, and around the world, indeed. So it's that is. Not a future that I can that that anybody can write right now. I'll tell you what I think and what I feel, but I've already been in a world and in an industry where AI is commonplace. It's just there. It's it's we couldn't have got to where we are now already without a, a, a level of AI, but a controlled specific um, machine learning AI that is within a box. Okay, it's been contained within the solutions until now. This is a different level of AI. So, um, in my experiences. Things that we can expect to obviously, I think, see more of, uh, I'll, I'll take some easy outs right now, is individuals and organizations are starting to use it and experiment with it and see what they can do, what it can, what it can value that it can provide. Um, we got to both understand and know, assume that somewhere on this little, you know, blue ball of ours floating around in outer space, that some people have gotten a hold of it and are thinking about, hmm, how can I do some things with it that are, that aren't great, that are, that are bad. Um, that's going to happen. I think with every release of new technology, whatever we've gone through, people have figured out how to twist and bend it and use it in ways that are just not good. Um, unfortunately, that's the world we live in. But on the good side of the fence, it's it's helping organizations right now, I think, think more creatively to enhance um, job function, to um, add flavor to. It's not to the point yet, I say yet, Um where I think it's directly impacting um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think in the weeks and months and in years to come, we're going to have to adapt um, and to it and embrace it. I personally think it's exciting. Um, I do see the harm it, it could do potentially, but I'm actually optimistic about the way it can impact what I do and the way that I use it to protect my company's organ or uh, networks, organizations, networks against the bad guys. It's going to cancel out. Uh, right now it does too. So we've got red team, blue team, purple team, hackers, ethical hackers, um, bad bad actors and such. They're all kind of negating each other with, they, they one up each other a little bit and they keep on catching up with each other. We both have access to AI. That's the good news. It's not exclusive to just the bad guys. Um, so the good guys have it. We'll use it for good. They'll try to use it for bad. It's just going to raise the stakes from a risk management perspective. Um, it feels like one of those things where you got to sit down at a bar over a couple of beers and you, this could go on for a while, but I personally don't have a crystal ball. I can't see the future, but for right now, I'm excited what I'm seeing, but I'm cautiously optimistic and we'll see. I'm trying not to give a cop out answer, but honestly, if I came from at this one from a point of authority, you, you call my, you call me out on it and as you should. So don't know. No, I think those are, uh, I think those are reasonable answers. I, I agree with you 100 percent on the uh, concept that there's going to be some nefarious actors mm -hmm. uh, that get a hold of this thing and are going to be up to no good. And I'm I'm very concerned about that. Um, as you know, as as you would reference with so many other technologies, that's always that's been the case. You're always going to see people who are ready to pounce. They're they're licking their chops uh, and they've probably, they've got their hands on it. They're trying to figure out how to, how to beat a system in a negative way. Uh, I, I'd be remiss on a, on a couple of things. I've looked at my notes uh, and two things that I want you to, I want you to tell our audience. Number one, you have a degree in computer science. Um, I did not say where that was from because it was not in my notes and I don't know where it's from. And I'd like to know where you got your degree in computer science from. That's number one. Number two is, how does how does Dan Gregory get into cybersecurity? I mean, what what was your journey? Those two things for our uh, for our loyal and committed audience, and and we can we can wrap it up. 
Sure, I appreciate it. I don't get a chance. I don't get asked this question very often, so I, I, I get a little sense of pride. I'm a Blue Devil. Uh, for those who know what that is, it's a very obscure little technical college in uh, Southeast Michigan, Lawrence Tech, otherwise known as Larry Tech, uh, class of 92. Um, computer science degrees back then were a little different than they are now. Um, I graduated high school in 87, so, you know, you do the math. Um I got lucky. I want well. I wanted to be a math teacher. That's a whole other story. That didn't work out, obviously. But um, I wanted to be. I was always a, a, a techno junkie. I uh, take things apart, try to figure out how they go back together again. I went and got my electrical engineering degree um, as well, and I found that you couldn't. I don't want to say you couldn't make money at it, but it was it was going to be a little bit harder back then. I just couldn't find the job I was looking for back then for whatever reason. Um, I ended up working for in the in in the beginning with a uh, a lease return company uh, where we would have Wang computers and IBM mainframes and all sorts of stuff come back on pallets. We clean it up, sell it out the front end, and I got to learn mechanically how all these things were put together. And I got interested in what's making them work internally, the operating systems, and that kind of naturally led to me being curious and going down a journey. This is many years ago. Um, to figure out how all that works. And then networking came into play and I was starting to play with that when that first kind of came on the scene. Um, and eventually I, we started consulting with some of our customers that were returning these computers. And like, yeah, we got a guy and he's pretty smart in technical stuff. Give him a job to do. And I would go out on site and you pick up things and you learn as you go along. And my Forrest Gump moments, um, uh, Kmart World Headquarters, Mascotech, Kelly World Services, uh, Decima Gossett Law Offices. I got a chance to do the rounds in different industries. I landed at Mascotech. They were the largest tier one supplier automotive um, in the world at the time. And that is truly when I got my mentoring from the people who kind of made me what I am today. To this day, I think back on them 25, 30 years later. And so that kind of got me really into it all, um, getting certifications and training and saying, this is what I really want to do. Uh, for a living. Um, and again, I'm very grateful to have had many me mentors blazing a path and taking a risk on me, to be quite honest. I was pretty young at the time. Um, and that's kind of what led me to, I tried my own thing for a while, I had my own company. We did some business consulting. Finally, CBI, my predecessor, uh, where I used to work, that got bought out by Converge. Um, they, they bought me and I joined them 22 years ago-ish. And then uh, now I'm I'm with Converge because we got bought out. So that's that's the short version of the whole story and how I got into it. Um, and I've always just wanted to do this. I'm one of the lucky ones. I found what I want to do early in life, and I love it. That's awesome. We I love to hear the stories of our guests for our listeners to know where you come from, how you got on this journey. We we have a number of I'm sure aspiring uh, cyber junkies out there who are listening in. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, folks who are look, maybe looking and entertaining a career in cyber and want to understand um, that there is a route. There's a route to get to be, at, you know, who's the next Dan Gregory. Um, and so I feel it's important that you share your story. Our guests share their story. Um, as far as Larry Tech's concerned and the Blue Devils, uh, I, you know, maybe there's some Larry Tech folks on this uh, who are listening in. And if they are, go Blue Devils. Appreciate you know your time today, Dan. Having you on here, uh, it's it's been great. Would love to have you back at some point. We'll talk about a different a different subject, uh, and uh, appreciate uh, just as much as I said earlier on behalf of PK Ware and, and our board of directors. Appreciate the commitment on the partnership. I feel we're on the verge of uh, you know really cracking a code and doing something special together. Uh, and appreciate you, uh, like I said, being the tip of that spear. Um, and uh, wishing you only uh, prosperity and good luck and health uh, in all that you continue to do at Converge and in and, and your personal life and everything else. And thanks for being our guest on Productivity Protected Podcast. So thankful and appreciative uh, that he shared and dropped his knowledge here on our podcast. Thanks for being here, Dan. Thanks for having me. Okay. Um, we're going to have a very special guest coming up here on episode 17. And you guessed it. I'm not telling you who it's going to be but they're very special. They're just, they're going to be special. Like Dan Gregory was special. Like all the others we've had here, it's going to be a great show we have lined up for you. So continue to tune in to the Productivity Protected Podcast. I'm Spencer Kupferman, your host uh, and CEO of PKWare. Thank you, customers, partners, uh, and all of our listeners around the globe here. Uh, this is the Productivity Protected Podcast. Thank you very much.
Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Productivity Protected. Learn more about how PKWare protects data and workflows by visiting pkware.com and join us next time for more insider info on protecting data wherever it lives and moves.